Hello and welcome back to Film Exaggeration. Oh boy. Honestly achieved it, and I know I have and I think you have. Then you should be proud of it. It helps other people, actually. In 1957, Russian native Ayn Rand wrote a book called Atlas Shrugged. For those who don't know, Ayn Rand developed a political philosophy called Objectivism that also was a main part of her books. I haven't read the original book since, well, it's over a thousand pages long, and so I know very little about Objectivism. Because I want to go into the 2011 adaptation, Atlas Shrugged Part 1, as blind as possible. Directed by One Tree Hill actor Paul Johansson, this film was the first in a trilogy that adapted the whole book. Like I said, the book is over 1,100 pages long. The film was in development since the 70s, with Rand herself even writing the screenplay, but after her passing, the rights passed on to her students, and after many delays, studios backing out, and several changes in cast, the film was given a small release in April 2011 and bombed so hard. Yeah, it only made $4.5 million on a $20 million budget. Critics weren't kind to it either, currently sitting at a 10% on Rotten Tomatoes, and audience reception was mixed at best. But it's still got the two sequels, which we'll get to some other time. So let's see if I can get through this without offending anyone. This is Atlas Shrugged, Part 1. So we begin in September 2016. Fuck September 2016. The United States has become a shithole with an economic depression, lack of industry, and resource shortages, including gas. Amazingly, this is only slightly worse than the actual 2016. Because of the gas shortages, the only mode of transportation for most people is by train, but there have been several derailments, which the CEO, James Taggart, refuses to take responsibility for. All this is being watched on TV at a diner when two men walk out. And not let others feed off the profits of his energy. It's funny. Exactly what I've been thinking. We're like you and I. Who are you? Okay, what the hell is going on? I'm only about five minutes in, I'm already confused. Tagger is losing business to a competitor as his assistant tries to warn him. Careful, Eddie. There's one thing I learned from my father. Everyone's expensive. His sister Dagny comes in and they talk a bunch of business jargon, but the main gist of it is Dagny's bought new rails and they are apparently cheap and stronger than steel. Yes, cheap and stronger. Usually that's something they say to sway in suckers, but hey, what do I know? So Dagny goes to meet with the guy making the rails, Hank Reardon, as they negotiate the price, eventually settling on 20000 a ton. They're doing their best to make it harder for you, aren't they? Yes, but it's useless to get angry with people like my brother and his friends in Washington. I don't have time for it. I have to undo what they've done. And after? After they won't matter anyway. Uh, is she gonna murder her brother? Hank returns home where we see his family, who turns out to be kinda shitty. Are you giving me a railroad spark? Another man would have given his wife a diamond bracelet. So far, the only characters I know anything about personality-wise are assholes. Goody. His brother Philip wants some money to help the less fortunate, and Hank agrees to give him some, not because he wants to help the less fortunate, but because he wants to help Philip. You see, Hank's only goal is to make money, and he's hated by the public and press. Well, I ask useless questions. How deep is the ocean? How high is the sky? Who is John Galt? So we then see a conversation with a politician named Wesley Meouch. The way it's spelled, it seems like Mooch. Is there a single good Wesley in film after The Princess Bride? And these big politicians want to make sure the CEOs like Hank are kept under control, or at least I think that's what they're saying. This is so boring and poorly directed and edited, I'm having trouble keeping track. The next day, Dagny meets with one of her employees named Owen, who resigns. Miss Taggart, I assure you, um, no person matter or event connected to my job has anything to do with my decision to leave. Why are you leaving? Who is John Galt? Okay, so why the hell are people disappearing whenever they ask who John Galt is? Also, for it taking place in late 2016, it's weird that there's no mention of the election. I mean, I know we all want to forget that election, but it, it still happened. A mine that the Taggers had invested in gets nationalized by the Mexican government, and after about 20 minutes of business meetings and dinner dates with the least interesting people on the planet, construction on these freaking railways finally begin. The State Science Institute is simply requesting that you stop production until the economy can stabilize. The answer is no. 
We can't afford to allow the expansion of a company which produces too much and might replace companies which produce too little. That is how you create an unbalanced economy. Well, that actually is true. If all the larger companies put all the smaller companies out of business, that creates a monopoly, the large company will boost up its prices, people won't buy the product, they have to lay off workers, and then the economy crashes. Basic economics. Why is it so important for you to struggle for years, squeezing out meager gains, rather than accept a fortune for Reardon Metal? Because it's mine. Do you understand that concept? Mine. You know, we're spending a lot of time with the villain of this movie. At least, I hope he's the villain. The press makes everyone think Hank's metal is unsafe, and as a result, Taggart's stocks fall. But Dagny has an idea to start up her own company, buy the railway, and this will allow their stocks to go up again. Okay. And what are you going to call this new line of yours, Dagny, because you're not dragging the family name through this? The John Galt line. And then she disappeared. No, she gets the funding, but a bill is passed in Congress that says any person can only own one business. So Hank has to sign off on all his other companies, leaving him only with the medal. And I'm just starting to realize, Hank is supposed to be the good guy. A selfish, egotistical asshole who only cares about himself is the person we are supposed to be rooting for. Dagny, this is uh, Mr. Brady, a delegate from the Union of Locomotive Engineers. You're busy, I'll be brief. We're not going to allow you to run that train on the John Galt line. Get out of here. The committee has decided that allowing men to run your train on that untested metal would violate their human rights. Are you serious, Mr. Brady? You can't force men to go out and get killed just for profit. Put that in writing. Seriously, this is our protagonist. This is who we're supposed to be rooting for. This is like watching a Christmas carol if the ghosts never showed up. But they manage to test the CG train as it goes off without a hitch. And so Dagny and Hank celebrate by drinking and having sex. And remember, Hank's married. I think you might want to meet this guy named Irving Rosenfeld. You might like him. As that's happening, their business partner Wyatt is visited by a shadowy man, and the next day, Dagny and Hank decide to go to Wisconsin to visit a closed-down factory that was apparently working on a new type of engine. It's a real mystery why the 20th Century Motor Company failed. It's no mystery. Bad ideas brought it down. Ideas? As I understand it, the company flattened the wage scale and still paid everyone according to their needs, not according to their contributions. Why all these stupid altruistic urges? It's not being charitable or fair. What is it with people today? Oh, fuck this movie! No, seriously, this scene pisses me off. At first, I thought this was a slam against the minimum wage, but no, they specifically say that the company made the decision to pay everyone more. So this movie is saying that even if the company wants to pay you more, if you work a lower skilled job, you deserve to make less. This movie is evil. They find an engine that can apparently create power through air, yet yeah, somehow makes electricity through the air. So they try to find the inventor, and after a long series of asking people, they find one of the inventor's professors, who now owns a diner. But he won't tell her anything. I'm not gonna give up trying to find the inventor of that motor. Oh, don't worry, Miss Jaggard. He'll find you. This movie is padded as fuck, and it's almost over! It's almost over, and I don't think much has happened. The government tries to lower how fast the John Galt trains can go, but also Wyatt's oil field suffered an explosion, so she goes to try and find him. Well, we tried. She doesn't find Wyatt, as it turns out that shadowy figure was John Galt, who wants to take him to a place called Atlantis. A wonderful place where businessmen don't have to worry about those pesky government regulations, and so he burned down his oil field and left. This is Ellis Wyatt. I'm gone. Don't try to find me. You won't. I am on strike. Yes, 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 yes. Aside from its backward-ass politics and the completely unlikable characters, the story is so padded out and boring, with some of the laziest acting I've seen in a theatrically released film. This was a dull, dull movie to watch, and so much of it is filler, just uninteresting that you can skip large parts of it. The editing is awful, I had a hard time keeping track of what was going on, and the direction is lifeless. This movie is just so unappealing to look at. I hated this movie. I hated it. Hated, hated it. And <laughs> I got two more of these freaking things to go. 
Oh.